Thank you very much, uh, Par, for your introductory remarks. And uh, excellencies, dear colleagues, thank you for being so numerous with, uh, with us here. I see a couple of ambassadors also in the audience. Thank you very much for being, for being with us. Um, as, you, as you've heard, we are co-organizing this event with our dear friends from Samoa. Thank you, Matilda, for being here with us, uh, with Deza, and also with our distinguished uh, friend, uh, the USG uh, High Representative for uh, LDCs, LLDCs, SIDS, Ambassador Rabab Fatima. Uh, you, we have to find a way to shorten this name. <laughs> <laughs> and, uh, and I also want to acknowledge and thank the other two uh, speakers that will be with us today. Uh, first of all, uh, the Director General of IOM, uh, Antonio Vitorino, thank you for taking the time to be here with us, and ASG for Policy Coordination and Interagency Affairs of DESA, Maria Francesca Spolitano. Um, so thank you very much. We are organizing this side event on the margins of the ECOSOC Partnership Forum. Uh, partnerships are at the center of a paradigm shift uh, that was introduced by the 2030 Agenda. And uh, today's event, as it was said, is a moment for us uh, to uh, reflect on how can we work together, how can we build better and more partnerships to achieve a meaningful results uh, uh, on the implementation of SDGs. Building these partnerships, these alliances is uh, fundamental. Um, and. Uh, Today's uh, forum is uh, a very important uh, stepping stone towards the HLPF in July, towards uh, the SDG summit in September. And so we thought that uh, uh, we could talk about, uh, about this very specific partnership that we uh, are working on, uh, willing to address the challenges of uh, climate-induced mobility in seeds. And this is not a challenge for tomorrow. This is a challenge that we have to face today. Climate change is a direct threat to people's lives and livelihoods, culture, and their own identity in the seats. Um, more frequent national disasters are causing substantial displace displacement internally and also migration flows to other countries every year. Sea level rising is also uh, adding complexity to this problem, and uh, we need to discuss uh, and find ways uh, to work together, uh, building on the necessary um, resilience of the local populations, and at the same time, uh, finding ways to finance the, the projects that we will be able to put together. This is an issue that is interlinked with a number of processes and agendas, starting with the 2030 Agenda and the Samoa Pathway, but also with the Global Pact for Migration and the recent uh, IMRF uh, um, Progress Declaration. So we're very glad to have here uh, the Director General for Migration. Uh, climate discussions also, the agenda of disaster risk reduction and the nexus between climate and security. So, um, in spite of having already uh, many uh, good ideas and good partnerships, we need to address uh, the, um, the ways where gaps exist. Uh, we need to see how can we, as multi-stakeholders, uh, um, put together these partnerships and so that they can play a vital role in addressing all the challenges. Um, we know that local solutions are fundamental. We want to hear from the stakeholders. So this is why, in addition of having these distinguished speakers here today, we will also hear directly from the Pacific and from the Caribbean uh, interventions uh, that are virtual during our panel, but that we want very much to listen to. As co-chairs with Samoa uh, of the steering committee of the SEEDS partnerships, Portugal wants to help moving this needle uh, forward, and we seek to do it bilaterally with the seats in different regions, uh, but also uh, through the multilateral program, the multilateral programs with regular contributions to programs such as UNDP's Climate uh, Promise uh, or to the Migration Multi Partner uh, Trust Fund. So uh, let's get. 
to the discussion, to uh, the debate. We need to know what is working, what is not working, uh, where do we need additional support, uh, uh, additional partners, additional financing. So I count with your active participation, and I hope really that today's event can contribute to answer some of these questions. Thank you very, very much. to invite the uh, High Representative uh, for LDC, uh, LLDC, and SIDS, uh, Ms. Rabab Fatima, uh, the Under Secretary General and High Representative of OHR LLS. Thank you. Rabab, the floor is yours. Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Pad. And I think you said it very nicely, OHR LLS. Even that's a tongue twister even for me <laughs> up until now. But thank you very much. <laughs> Uh, Ambassador Anna Paula uh, Zacharias, uh, uh, Director General Antonio Vitorino, uh, ASG Maria Francesca uh, Spatolisano, Excellencies, uh, distinguished delegates, dear colleagues, uh, we're indeed very pleased uh, to join the permanent missions of Portugal and Samoa, uh, the International Organization for Migration and UN DESA in organizing this very important event. And it's uh, particularly wonderful and special uh, to be sharing the podium with my very dear friends, Ambassador Ana Paula and DG Vitorino, amongst others. Uh, I would like to start by congratulating the permanent missions of Portugal and Samoa for co-chairing uh, the Steering Committee on SIDS Partnership. And uh, we commend and appreciate your strong leadership to promote durable uh, partnerships for the SIDS. And I wish to thank you also, Ambassador, for putting in perspective the challenge that we have before us and the critical importance of partnership in addressing that. Excellencies, I deeply appreciate the focus of today's event on addressing the challenges of climate-induced human mobility in SIDS. And if I'm not wrong, this is the second such event uh, that I'm addressing that IOM organized uh, on this same subject in the last six weeks or so. Uh, this is a topic uh, which is very close to my heart. Uh, from years of working on the front line of climate crises, and more recently, I had the opportunity to make my small contribution to this discourse here when I had the honor to co-facilitate uh, co the Progress Declaration for the first International Migration Review Forum. The Progress Declaration reaffirms uh, climate change as a driver of migration and calls for efforts to enhance pathways for, for the safe, orderly, and regular migration. And today, I would like to focus on three key areas for your kind attention. First, I will cover the ongoing and uh, overlapping crises facing the SIDS, which are driving migration and internal displacement. And then I'll touch upon what my office is currently doing alongside our partners to support the islands. And finally, I would like to briefly touch upon the future and what else we can do together. Excellencies, if you look now at the current situation, as the climate crisis worsens, island communities around the world are increasingly under risk of displacement and pressure to seek out safe havens. Rising sea levels, ever more powerful storms, and increased natural hazards are forcing more and more islanders to migrate or be internally displaced. Over the past 50 years, natural hazards have resulted in an estimated 5.14 million new internal displacements in the Caribbean alone. Each year, Weather extremes and climate impacts forces more than 50,000 Pacific Islanders to flee their homes. These numbers are on the rise with devastating consequences. Livelihoods are under threat. Communities are exposed to water shortages, food security, and diseases. The risk of violence and conflict is ever increasing, and all these make the climate crisis potentially a threat to stability, security, and survival. And now these vulnerabilities are further impacted by shocks like the COVID-19 pandemic. The pandemic highlighted, once again, the vulnerability of the SIDS. It reversed decades of the development gains. Distinguished delegates, now what is to be done? Or what is being done? There are, of course, successful examples of partnerships to address the challenge of climate-induced mobility in the SIDS, and Ambassador um, Zakarias mentioned some of them. These also include the Pacific Climate Change, Migration, and Human Security Initiative, 
and the Eastern Caribbean Human Security Disaster Displacement and Environmental Migration Initiative. At the OHR LLS, we are collaborating with partner organizations to address these challenges through our climate-related work in five important areas. Firstly, in establishing a global data hub on climate finance for the SIDS. Secondly, exploring a specific SIDS envelope under the Green Climate Fund's enhanced enhancing direct access pilot. Third, supporting the alliance of small island states on loss and damage negotiations heading into COP28. Fourthly, continuing our collaboration with the Economic Commission for Latin America and the Caribbean on the operationalization of the Caribbean Resilience Fund. And finally, collaborating with the UN system and the Pacific Islands Forum Secretariat on UN support for the implementation of the 2050 strategy for the Blue Pacific Continent. Dear colleagues, we also facilitate partnerships that contribute to the implementation of the Samoa Pathway and the SDGs in the SIDS. And we support the Steering Committee on SIDS Partnership under the SIDS Partnership Framework. We look forward to the 2023 SIDS Partnership Dialogues and the SIDS Partnerships Awards, which recognizes good partnership work including those that tackle environmental challenges. And uh, we are convening the next SIDS uh, Global Business Network Forum in the Caribbean in 2024, which will aim to stimulate public-private partnership for accelerating the SDGs implementation in the SIDS. Excellencies, distinguished colleagues, and now what next? More than ever before, the international community must demonstrate their shared commitment to support the SIDS in tackling their challenges including, I would say, I would like to emphasize this, including in addressing the gaps that exist in the normative framework uh, related to people displaced by climate events. They must not falter to fulfill their promises to leave no one behind. The fourth UN conference of the SIDS in 2024 will provide an opportunity for the international community to adopt a new program of action and strengthen partnerships for the SIDS. And the international community should also listen to the SIDS call for a multidimensional vulnerability index. The multidimensional vulnerability index can help them access concessional finance to invest in sustainable development. And my office is supporting, along uh, with the UN DESA, the UN uh, high level panel that is working on the multidimensional vulnerability index or the MVI. Excellencies, distinguished colleagues, uh, let me rest it here, and I would like to thank you once again for this opportunity to share a few thoughts and to partner with you for this important event, and we look forward to remaining fully engaged and uh, to our continued partnership in addressing this issue. Thank you very much. Far over to you. Thank you. ...that I'm sure we'll come back to during the panel discussions uh, a little bit later. Um, but now I have the, the pleasure to invite the Director General of uh, the International Organization for Migration, IOM, um, and he also is my boss, uh, Mr. Antonio Vitorino. Um, please, the floor is yours, sir. <coughs> Thank you so much, Par, and uh, Excellencies, dear colleagues, ladies and gentlemen. It's my pleasure to be here today and to share with you a few thoughts about uh, the debate that uh, brings us uh, together. As it has already been said, around the globe, the impacts of climate change are making it imperative for people to move. Uh, in the past decade, we have seen climate change influencing the migration of thousands in the seas, and they have left around three million islanders globally living particularly in low-lying coastal zones, highly exposed to, to climate vulnerabilities. Between 2010 and 2021, some 914,000 internal displacements were recorded only in the Pacific, more than half of which were caused by storms, including tropical cyclones. But we could say that uh, human mobility is a consequence of climate change, and that's true. But uh, from my perspective, it is also a potential avenue for increasing resilience in the communities in the face of uh, increasing uh, climate-induced human 
security uh, threats. As livelihoods are threatened by climate change and the vulnerability of households has increased definitely, migration has become a key strategy to build resilience and diversify incomes. At the same time, we have observed and uh, partnered with countries in the relocation of uh, population related to climate change across the seas, whether in the Pacific, in the Caribbean, or in the Atlantic Indian Oceans. And we do that through our network of offices that uh, we have in those regions. And as a leading agency for migration, we have been uh, actively engaged in supporting uh, SEEDS in better preparing for and responding to disasters. Our aim is to prevent forced migration. People do not want to leave their land. People need to be supported to build resilience, to confront the impacts in their daily lives because of climate change. But of course, if no alternative exists, we need also to address the aspects of migration related to climate change as a tool of adaptation, leveraging the positive outcomes of human mobility. However, these efforts do not lead to results if not carried out in collaboration and partnerships with all the stakeholders in and for seats, starting with the communities that are more directly affected and impacted by climate change. In IOM's view, the Samoa pathway highlights the need to acknowledge and build upon the positive impacts that migration can have for development. An idea that, by the way, is reinforced through the Global Compact for Safe, Orderly, and Regular Migration, which is one of the UN texts that more detailed is concerning the link between climate change and human mobility. And this link has been amplified through the Progress Declaration of the First International Migration Review Forum held in 2022, and I want to pay tribute here to uh, Ambassador Rabah Fatima, whose uh, magic pen uh, allowed us to have a consensual progress declaration addressing some of the issues that bring us together. Thank you, madam. Human mobility, in my view, broadly speaking, is uh, critical to development in seeds, as well as a crucial adaptation measure to the impacts of climate change. So I would suggest that our collective priority should therefore be to empower and enhance the resilience and capacity of people, communities, and institutions of seats. And building on the conclusions of uh, COP27 in Sharm El Sheikh, where for the first time formally, the COP process recognized that there are huge impacts in terms of human mobility today and we need to address the challenges of the people that are impacted by climate change. And paving the way, of course, to COP28. I know that the debate on the loss and damage fund is going to be a critical debate. Hopefully, there will be conclusions. But we should not just look to the loss and damage fund. We should focus also on the existing green funding tools at our uh, disponibility. Uh, in our diplomatic way, I will say that uh, from our take, access to green funding is too cumbersome, too difficult, and sometimes too slow. And we need to look at the possibilities of those green fundings to act now, because it is absolutely necessary to act now. So let's not wait for the loss and damage fund when it will come, it will be most welcome, but let's focus on what we can do in the short term because those are the needs of, people, of the people impacted by climate change, starting precisely with uh, the seeds. So this is my message, and uh, my final note is you can count on IOM. Thank you.
Uh, and uh, thank you for sharing your thoughts and, and insights. Um, we now have the pleasure to invite uh, Maria Francesca Spatulisano, uh, Assistant Secretary General uh, from the United Nations Department of Economic and Social Affairs, what we usually in the system refer to DESA. Uh, so please, Madam, the floor is yours. <coughs> Thank you, thank you, Per, and Ambassador Anna Paola Zaccaria, and Matilda Bartley, and USG Rabab Fatima, and DG IUM Antonio Vittorino, Excellencies, distinguished participants, ladies and gentlemen, it is my pleasure, really a pleasure, to address this important side event on behalf of DESA in such good and knowledgeable company. And my thanks go to, first of all, to the co-chairs of the Steering Committee on Partnerships for Small Island Developing States for leading the organization of this event. And I thank our colleagues from the IOM and the uh, UNHRLS for their great <laughs> collaboration. Sorry, I still exercise. <laughs> and of course, I also acknowledge the presence of so many distinguished participants who are connected online. Uh, if you will hear some repetition, it's only normal. We will show that our analysis is consistent. Mm -hmm. So I will <laughs> refer <laughs> to the reasons of, uh, you know, crisis, uh, ongoing crisis that we all know about, the adverse impacts of climate change, such as extreme weather, change in precipitation patterns and coastal inundation, desertification, glacial melt, sea level rise. All these continue to interfere with our livelihoods, food system, and health. And ultimately, I would add, with our uh, social stability, with our societies, so the connecting texture of our societies, and increasingly affecting human mobility patterns. And this is particularly true in seeds, where many communities live on, on or close to low-lying uh, coastal zones. And as we know, seeds economies are also heavily dependent on tourism, agriculture, and fishing industries. And these are all industries uh, quite susceptible, susceptible to changes in weather patterns and environmental degradation. All this leads to risking, of course, a lot of uh, uh, job losses, food insecurity, and increased uh, competition over natural resources. And in instance, uh, this can contribute to large scale movements of people, as we heard, including re relocation. So the COVID-19 pandemic has further exacerbated these predicaments. Health and socioeconomic degradation caused by the pandemic continue to add pressure to the seeds government budgets to allocate their resources to recovery, to, to a, a, you know, immediate needs, uh, including through uh, external borrowing. So in the medium term, there is an issue there, obviously. So excellencies, let me quote our Secretary General. No country, he said, can fight the pandemic or manage migration alone. It is indeed important that the international community show solidarity with the seeds. As Rabab was saying, you have to hear this call and uh, show solidarity. Together, in partnerships, which is the theme we are addressing today, we, we have, in fact, and we can continue to mitigate climate change impacts, contain the spread of the virus, buffer their impacts on the most vulnerable, and recover better for the benefits of all. And this is why this event on partnership is so important and relevant. The effective partnering uh, that we have in mind is about leveraging and optimizing the combination of available resources. Nobody has everything, but we can work together to pull together our resources. Multi-stakeholder partnerships can provide an efficient and effective mechanism for meeting a whole range of sustainable development priorities. And the SEEDS partnership framework under the Samoa pathway was designed to promote partnerships for the sustainable development of SEEDS. UN DESA, the department uh, I have the honor to serve in, through its partnership accelerator program, 
is supporting member states and other stakeholders in providing that platform for partnership so that we can exchange experiences, lessons learned, and innovative ideas in the implementation of the Samoa path pathway and also the SDGs as a global framework. So, Excellencies and colleagues, by working together in partnership, we can rebuild and advance, united by a common ambition, I would say, to achieve a sustainable development for all and leaving no one behind. In a true partnership, let me note as well as last comment, each contributor must benefit from this collaboration, and we must learn to see our work through the eyes of our potential partners. So it's important we bring all the stakeholders around the table to nurture a genuine partnership. And so I very much look forward to hearing uh, the examples of partnership working together to address climate-induced human mobility in SIDS. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, uh, Assistant Secretary General, uh, for, your, for your remarks. Um, that uh, closes the opening session of, of this um, side event, uh, and we will now uh, go into the panel discussion. Very pleased to uh, announce that we have three um, experts with us, uh, literally from around the world, um, whereof two are joining online, uh, one from Pacific and one from the Caribbean, uh, and um, I will introduce them in just uh, a second. Um, and we also have one uh, of the panelists here in the room. So, uh, first of all, let me just introduce um, Francis uh, Nanmomo, who is the, uh, from the Ecological Stewardship and Climate Justice Program Coordinator at the Pacific Conferences of Churches, joining us online from uh, Fiji. Um, she is um, actively engaged in the development of the regional framework uh, on climate mobility in the Pacific, <coughs> and also worked closely with relocated communities in Fiji and the region. Uh, we have here in the room with us um, Matilda Bartley, the Deputy Permanent Representative, Councillor of the Permanent Mission of Samoa to the United Nations. Um, very pleased to have you here, of course, as well, Matilda, in the room today. Um, and we have online, uh, as well, from the Caribbean, uh, Ambassador Francine Baron, uh, Chief Executive Officer of the Climate Resilience Execution Agency for Dominica, called CRED, joining us from Dominica. Uh, and um, is the uh, CEO of, uh, of that uh, or organization uh, and tasked with supporting the implementation of Dominica's Climate Resilience Recovery Plan. So three very distinguished panelists. Um, We'll pose a couple of questions to the panelists, uh, and then we'll also open up the floor for an, for an open discussion uh, for all of you, both in the room and, and online. Um, I will start with um, a question um, to our colleague uh, in, in Fiji. Um, so from your perspective, what are the key roles of civil society in promoting multi-stakeholder partnerships for climate-related human mobility. Um, Ms. Namuno, the floor is yours. Thank you very much. Excellencies, distinguished um, guests, ladies and gentlemen, Nisan Bolovinaka. Uh, first of all, I would like to take this opportunity to thank the organizers of this event for the invitation to represent the voices of civil societies from the Pacific in this panel. I've been asked to respond to the question, as uh, mentioned earlier, what are the key roles of civil society in promoting multi-stakeholder partnership for climate-related human mobility? As some of you may know, civil society in the Pacific is very diverse and play an important enabling role as an ally and implementing partner to support states, intergovernmental institutions, and other stakeholders in the advancement of issues like the climate-related human mobility. One of our key strengths um, is our composition, diversity, structure, and experiences. For greater collaboration, we try to ensure to include voices and representatives from non-government organizations, faith-based, voluntary work, community-based, and grassroots um, organizations. 
with specific focus placed on supporting the engagement and protection of the most marginalized and vulnerable communities so no one is left behind. Um, and we are referring to women, children, youth, persons living with disabilities and displaced persons amongst others. The diversity of CSOs unites to drive commitments on a common issue at different levels. Our pathways, partnership and strengths are often shared by our different contexts, experiences and what we have seen or have experienced effective for the communities we serve. I guess this is a critical process for us because it's a process to share information, to build knowledge, uh, which becomes part of our advocacy, our campaigning, our education, capacity building, and of course, awareness raising when we are gathering in these spaces. Um, and in gathering, in being part of this process, it also shifts conversation from one that only looks at the project or the lifeline of the project, but something that be, that is beyond. How do we mobilize people to start um, understanding this issue, to actively and meaningfully engage, participate, creating a community of practice and movement building also that it employs intergenerational approach, cross-regional learning of actors and movements in different region. In the Pacific, I would say there have been milestones achieved in localizing the agenda. We work alongside national and local partners, recognize and respect their strength in mobilizing leadership, governance structures to better reach and achieve the needs of affected communities. While the advocacy and partnership for the coordinated implementation of commitment is ongoing, we've also seen and encountered challenges, you know, from a very tight restrictive funding platforms to a lack of enabling environment and infrastructures to support these initiatives. It is therefore important to ensure Resources and support are well uh, supports are well coordinated. There is funding to support to support a people centered approach, and an ongoing effort to support young people initiative and investment on youth leaders who play a critical role in the sustainability of this engagement. In times of crisis, we have observed, seen, and experiences all hands on deck from governments, CSOs. Um, faith-based organization, women, network of young people, voluntary network, uh, persons living disability, we work towards a common goal. Now, to achieve a greater response means for us respecting and recognizing this diverse and multifaceted intergenerational feminist movements talk about intersectional experiences and providing a space to enhance this knowledge and learnings to bring about um, the change um, for all. In being inclusive, um, we often are reminded about creating a safe space. How does that look like? How do we ensure processes to design, develop, and create these spaces are safe? That we're, um, you know, we, are we co-creating this together? Ensuring specific resources is available for groups to engage effectively. You know, processes are documented and compliance is put in place to ensure accountability. At the Pacific Conference of Churches, we like to share the concept of weaving the mat, weaving baskets or ropes. We all represent different strands. And when the mat is completed, spread for use, sitting, we look around. Who else is not sitting on the mat? Who should be invited on the mat? Traditional leaders, other elders, um, voice important, uh, young people, children. Um, so this is very critical in our engagement. And one of the key goals, I guess, uh, for regional CSOs and networks is to actively, while it actively represents constituencies, voices and experiences, it's main, I guess, one of the key goals is to inform policies and decision making through legislation, planning and programs at national level, regional frameworks, and of course, the global agenda. How do we shift that conversation? In doing so, it is also challenge, it is also for us challenging the status quo the narrative and the framing of the issues and solution that in our case may require specific context and approach, framework and talent or dialogue that continuously needs to happen to address other emerging issues on this particular issue. To conclude, um, I would like to share the Cure Declaration. This is an outcome from the Cure consultation that took place in the uh, end of last year bringing together representatives from the civil society organization from the Pacific and Oceania, 
frontline and indigenous communities, grassroots organization, youth networks, and faith-based organization to highlight key messages for COP27. A well-articulated item in this outcome was on cure finance mechanism that highlights funding mechanism to support community priorities. How can we work together as CSOs? Now, we were approaching cyclone season towards November last year. Um, as team, as people were going, as our representative from the Pacific were going to COP27, we were mobilizing um, partners here in the Pacific. As we know, the disaster does contribute to people moving. We responded to a request from a maritime island in Fiji, Watulele Island, through the Methodist Church in Fiji, to support continued recovery work post-Tropical Cyclone Herald in 2020, and of course, preparedness for the cyclone season ahead. While the Pacific Conference of Churches provided the logistic and administration works, partners from the Presbyterian Church USA supported um, us with a solar-powered refrigerator to help um, economic livelihood for the young people. The Pacific Island Forum Secretariat supported the engagement with the content of dignity packs for women and girls, coloring books for children on the, um, the safety or keeping our oceans safe. Shifting the Power Coalition supported the um, solar lights and floodlights for the recreation center. And of course, we were transported to the to Watulele Island via the Utunyalo, a traditional canoe that promotes sustainable sea transportation and um, reviving indigenous knowledge of voyaging. That's the picture I would leave, like to leave with us today that brings out the unique role of civil society organization and how best we can all work together with the limited resources we have to respond to our communities. Thank you very much. much uh, for sharing the perspective from from your daily work and, and from the Pacific um, having had the pleasure of serving four years in the Pacific I must say that um, uh, a lot of what you're describing is, is something that I've had the pleasure of witnessing on, on the ground and and I think especially not only all the progress that is being made but also that you highlighted some of the challenges which I think is something that we definitely need to to keep in mind as we as we move forward, um, and I specific, specifically took took note of the generational approach, which um, again I think is something that that is very um, significant in the in the context of the Pacific. So, thank you so much. Um, we will move on to the uh, next panelist, which uh, is then with us here in the room, um, Matilda. Um, if you could share with us a little bit, how, how is it in, in your region, uh, the Pacific region, um, and, and how does the region respond to the challenges of climate-related human mobility, uh, including displacement? The floor is yours. Thank you very much, Par, and, and excellencies. Um, and thank you also for the opportunity to present, uh, uh, to allow me to present and speak on this issue. I'll just preface my comments by making uh, this notation, please, for your advice that I am no expert. Um, I am offering my perspective on, uh, as a participant uh, in Samos delegation uh, to the dialogues which were held uh, between 2019 and 2021 uh, with the Pacific Climate Change Migration and Human Security <coughs> Program, uh, which produced a summary of outcomes, which um, is no secret in, in, in a lot of uh, people in the room have already sort of illustrated the concerns that had arisen from these um, dialogues. I'll have to say, though, um, in thinking about this uh, side event and the issues of climate change, human mobility, COVID-19 recovery, it's quite obvious that none of these issues can be tackled on its own, and programs with any degree of success needs to be interlinked and interconnected because these issues cannot be decoupled from one another. Um, we hope, though, with COVID-19 recovery that that will eventually be uh, an issue that we can look past and beyond and prepare for for the future in future pandemics with the lessons learned. Um, I will maybe draw your attention a little bit to some very interesting um, developments that had happened over the past years, I, I felt, in, in relation to, to climate mobility in particular. And I, I, I don't want to call out anyone in the room, and please, because um, we understand that these are legal decisions made by governments and, 
And what I found interesting was in the judgment that was rendered and, and the acknowledgement by the legal community that there are legal considerations for, for these issues in the future. Um, I came across a case uh, called Ioane Te Tiota versus the Chief Executive of the Ministry of Business, Innovation, and Employment of New Zealand, which was raised in 2015. And although the Kiribati citizen that was involved with this had, was, in, was appealing an order of deportation on the grounds of um, the impacts of climate change uh, on Kiribati, did not qualify um, uh, him for a refugee status. It was interesting to note that the court also expressed concern um, about, hold on, <laughs> sorry, I should say, although the, the case was eventually dismissed, and upon appeal, the Supreme Court noted that its decision does not rule out the possibility that, in quote, environmental degradation resulting from climate change or other natural disasters could create a pathway into the refugee convention or protected person jurisdiction, end quote. And I found that to be interesting because there was some sort of recognition that although it might not be an issue right now and at this moment in the legal sense in terms of refugee status, it can um, be considered in the future because we don't know to what extent is exactly climate change will be impacting uh, people mobility to that extent that climate refugees will become an accepted norm. So I found that to be uh, something for us to consider because human mobility in particular has been very important for the Pacific, uh, and especially in the context of labor mobility. And when we consider our recovery from COVID-19 and the, and the need to ensure that employment opportunities provided uh, by the easy access of our laborers to um, you know, you know, income, um, that we should not just be reacting to crisis, but trying to get ahead of the problem. And the kinds of partnerships that have arisen in the Pacific in particular, uh, especially with uh, New Zealand and Australia, who have regional recognized seasonal employment programs, which the Pacific uh, peoples are, um, are benefiting from, uh, that these sort of partnerships could perhaps be expanded. I mean, there is a need to look at labor mobility as a whole, and, and, and I'm not going to try and tackle that here, but it is somewhat an, a, a consideration in terms of addressing the gaps in, in, in the labor force for a lot of countries and providing that much needed avenue for, for, for countries that are facing uh, a lack of access to uh, high paying jobs or for, for, for any sort of income earning uh, um, opportunities for very poor families. So, so that's something to consider as well. Um, some Pacific Island countries already have access agreements with um, countries like Australia, New Zealand, and the US, which already host large diasporas from the Pacific. Um, and as I mentioned, there are some countries that em employ uh, a lot of, of the Pacific labor force in work programs, which are seasonal and provide a very good opportunity. And during COVID-19, uh, the, during the COVID-19 pandemic, uh, those regional uh, seasonal workers that were already in place in New Zealand and Australia had their contracts extended way beyond what they were normally uh, supposed to have, which was, I think, around about three or six months, um, to enable them to also to, to fill in that, that gap because no one was able to come in, no one was able to leave, and, and, and that opportunity provided uh, income because for Samoa in particular, we rely quite heavily on, re on remittances. And uh, the remittances that were flowing from a lot of these regional seasonal workers that were in place in New Zealand and Australia was a lifeline for a lot of our smaller communities that depended on them. And this is not to say that there's no issues for those communities whose labor force basically has left the country. We are facing quite a number of issues with regard to the lack of uh, suitable uh, laborers to perform the necessary agricultural production that would be necessary to, for our own food security. So there are some wider issues to, 
to keep in mind. Uh, it's not an end all for all of these problems, but I think with more policy dialogue and engagements that there are, there is room for improvement um, across the board. Um, <clears throat> sorry. And I will, I will agree with the comments made by uh, the Director General of ILM that unplanned migration can result uh, or has resulted in uh, a lot of uh, problems. Um, and, and it comes back to my point that I made earlier in that it is, a, it is much better to be proactive than reactive in, in, in all, a, a, lot, a lot of these issues because um, when you're only reacting, you, you don't have much room for planning, for making sure that there's a smooth process and making sure that there are contingencies in place. And we see that a lot, especially in the news, even nowadays. I mean, even turning on the news for in New York, uh, you see what has happened with a lot of the, the influx of migrants into New York City, um, which is a reactive reaction to the fact that um, they didn't have much planning put in place for it. So you're seeing that there's a lot of expenditure, a, a lot of uh, relocation, a lot of you know, stress as well on, on these migrants that are trying to find a suitable place to stay warm uh, and find work uh, into the future. And this is not something that we would like our people, especially, you know, to, to be facing. So this is something to, to put on the back burner, especially for those who are interested in expanding their partnerships. Um, I think I, I'm going to wrap up with saying that um, the, the labor migration issue, the climate change issue, um, these are all issues that have to be tackled together, as I said, holistically. Uh, most people don't want to leave their countries for an indefinite period of time. They like to be sure that if they do leave the country for work or for school, that they can come home. And, and that, I think, is a universal um, concept I think most of you would agree with. Um, and if there is that surety of movement and that surety that they will have a home to come to, because if climate change gets to that point where they won't have a home, um, then that's another set of problems that we will have to deal with in the future, which uh, hopefully won't be in my lifetime or my children's lifetime. <laughs> but I will, um, yeah, I think I will wrap it up here. And I hope that this has been um, something for the digestion of the group and uh, leave some time for questions and answers. Thank you so much. Thank you very much, uh, Matilda, and um, also for bringing in the link uh, between climate security issues and, and labor mobility, which is something that uh, is uh, very, very much the topic in, in the uh, Pacific, for example, and, and there are joint programs amongst the UN agencies um, on that. So thank you for bringing that up. I think it will generate some questions. We have one more panelist. Um, and that is uh, Ambassador Baron, um, and um, we will um, have an intervention uh, about five minutes or so, and then we'll open up the, the floor. Um, I have been told that we can use the room a little bit longer, so we will probably, uh, if you are able to stay, be able to stay uh, on for 10 minutes or, or so, um, if there's interest from the floor. Um, so, um, Ambassador Baron, could you, uh, in about five minutes, tell us what do you think are the key to successful partnership in addressing climate-related human mobility from your perspective? Over to you. Thank you and good afternoon to everyone, excellencies, uh, distinguished ladies and gentlemen. I, I really want to thank uh, the organizers for inviting me to be part of this important conversation. And um, as we know, the Caribbean is extremely vulnerable to extreme weather events and external shocks. And um, Dominica is acutely aware of the impact of climate-related disasters on human mobility because in, both in, in 2015, from a tropical storm, uh, it caused the internal displacement of two entire communities who had to be permanently relocated from disaster zones into entirely new communities. And in 2017, Hurricane Maria uh, caused damage and triggered approximately 20,000 people leaving, leaving the island. Uh, while these numbers are not accurately verified as the estimated uh, exodus, the reality is that many people left and many people were internally displaced as well. 
And assuming that the figures were correct, it would mean that out of a population of roughly 70,000 people, about a quarter of our population left the island, um, and thousands more would have been internally displaced. So th this is just an indication of the impact that uh, extreme weather events can have on a country. So the issue of climate-induced mobility is of critical importance to our small states, because usually when disaster strikes, the whole country is impacted. And climate stressors trigger migration, internal displacement, and relocation. And we do have international governance frameworks, such as under the UNFCCC, with the Task Force on Displacement, the Global Compact for Safe and Orderly Migration, and the Global Compact on Refugees, which focus primarily on actions in respect of persons who are displaced or forced to migrate for one reason or another. But what about the focus on preventing or limiting the need for migration in the first place? And, and that is where I'd like to focus. And I think in addressing the, the, the question, one has to consider what prompts a person to leave their home after a disaster. Is it issues of access to services, clean water, electricity, food, a roof over their heads, destroyed livelihoods? Sometimes all of these things are experienced, and that brings a sense of hopelessness and despair. And how do, how do we address this? Uh, we believe the answer for us lies in building our resilience minimizing damage from climate-related events and other shocks like COVID-19 and reducing the period for recovery. And key to this is in ensuring that we, we have a clear national resilience plan that is understood by all, is people-centered, and that private and public sector are committed to taking the necessary action to build individual, community, and national resilience in accordance with that plan. So those who want to, to, to help uh, with with that must fit within that resilience framework, support the building of capacity and provide financing necessary to adapt and support resilience building measures. So there, there must be a partnership that focuses on what the country wants. So one has to look at the level of preparedness and how can we fit into helping people to be, be more prepared. So to answer questions like, how do I take action to make my home more secure from flooding, from wind damage, from landslides? Uh, do I have access to food? Do I have insurance? Or can I take other steps to secure my livelihood? Am I aware of vulnerabilities in my community? What actions can I take to support community resilience? What about the resilience of our public infrastructure? Can children go back to school within days of a disaster and not months? Do we incorporate scenarios into our programming to allow for better and faster response? Do we or can we invest in measures to make us more sustainable, to make our livelihoods less susceptible to collapse? And the quicker that we can resume a sense of normalcy post-disaster, the less incentive there will be for people to want to leave their homes and uproot their families and their lives. How do we create a resilient people that understand the principle of leaving no one behind, that value national resilience and respect for people and the environment? So there's an importance to have a resilience planning framework that really is centered around the holistic approach to resilience and that seeks to institutionalize resilience in strategic planning policy systems and links budgeting to resilience planning. And it's important for the partners that we work with to support us in building individual community and infrastructure resilience and addressing in a systematic way areas of weakness and vulnerability. We, we speak here with the issue of the impact of COVID-19 and to a large extent, its impact has been lengthened by the ongoing conflict in Ukraine and its impact on the availability of the cost of food, fuel, and materials. But when we talk about sustainability and resilience, we need to develop robust economies that are better able to withstand these shocks. So how do our partners work with us to share technologies, build capacities, and diversify revenue streams? How do we ensure that we have reliable data to inform effective and evidence-based planning? There, we spoke today about the, the, the availability of financing through the, the Green Climate Fund, the Loss and Damage Fund, um, the Resilience Fund. But the reality is that for small states, our ability to access funding is, is very limited. So funding is pledged, but we're not able to access it in a timely manner. And for us, time is not on our side. Uh, we, we see the more and more extreme weather events that are truly devastating to our, to our countries. And we have to build a level of resilience that requires us to be able to access funding in a timely fashion. 
because we, we have to build better, we have to build stronger, we have to put systems in place to ensure that we have a level of resilience to what the impacts that we know are coming. So how can organizations, UN organizations, partner agencies, World Bank, and, and, uh, and other partners work with us to build that level of resilience, looking at the resilience plans that we have and seeing how we can be supported in, in, in ensuring that we, are, we, we can, in fact, become resilient. And really, I, I know I have five minutes. We, we really could spend days discussing and distilling this issue. Um, but I think the point of departure should be to focus on supporting countries, especially small island developing states, to implement their resilience plans, to put policies, procedures, systems in place to build capacity and support adaptation planning so that we minimize the impact of disasters and the possibility of internal displacement and therefore the motivation for people to migrate from um, climate impacts. So thank you. Thank you so much for sharing uh, that uh, perspective. I think you uh, raised a lot of uh, issues, many questions. You answered most of them yourself, which was uh, very, very good. Uh, but it still, I think, definitely uh, leads us straight into the next segment uh, of today's uh, event, and that is um, a discussion amongst all of us, uh, both in the room as well as as well as online. Uh, as I said, um, I do believe that we can uh, extend uh, for for ten minutes, so we have about twenty minutes for uh, discussions. Um, and um, I would uh, encourage anyone that would like to take the floor. Uh, if you're in the room, please raise your hand. Um, and if you're online, raise your hand. Uh, and um, just very briefly introduce yourself and please make your intervention a comment or a question within a minute, please, so that we give everybody the opportunity to share some of the thoughts. Um, and we did ask in advance for some that were, um, uh, or, or some in expressed interest online uh, via the registration form to, to to make some interventions. Um, and the first one that I have on my list, uh, if the list is correct, uh, is the ambassador of Slovenia. If uh, the ambassador would like to take the floor, then that is um, OK. Thank, thank you. you. The floor is yours, uh, ambassador. Thank you very much. Yeah, thank you very much. Can you hear me? Yeah, let me let me first uh, uh, thank the both co-chairs, uh, Portugal and Samoa, uh, UNDESA and uh, ASG, USG, uh, DG, uh, Vitorino. Uh, I'll, I'll try to shorten it uh, uh, for this for this event. With the complexity of climate change and the influences on on human mobility and migration, and uh, water stress, the wide-ranging partnership with regional, national, and local actors are, are of course key to addressing the, the the challenges and to build resilient societies. Uh, Slovenia, we welcome the, that the focus of today's event is really on hearing uh, and engaging with the, with the voices from, from the ground. Um, as, as consequences of, of climate change do, do, to a different extent, affect us all. The climate disaster and mobility are not concerned only of, of one state or one region, but, but global, as a global challenge which needs a collective response. Uh, we need, therefore, solidarity and cooperation to find uh, sustainable solutions and effectively tackle these challenges. For my country, Slovenia, sustainable water use, uh, food and environment management, uh, the fight against climate change and good governance and promoting good governance have been at the forefront of our development cooperation. We also promote better understanding of climate-related uh, human mobility among our own citizens and decision makers. Um, and this is an important part of our regional response to climate-related mobility. With this in mind, a uh, concrete example, our foreign ministry is currently cooperating with an NGO, uh, uh, its, its name is Sloga, uh, a regional, on a regional campaign to support and build a better future for climate-induced migrants. Uh, let me conclude by saying that we need to uh, introduce global governance reforms, of course, re that are required for the multilateral system to deliver better on the the pressing issues of mobility. And the last point, we really need to translate solidarity into concrete action. And whereas, of course, the political will is crucial, crucial for meeting, uh, uh, for making the challenge. I thank you again for, 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 for your presentations and, and this event. Thank you. 
Thank you very much, Ambassador, and thank you for your very useful uh, intervention and, um, again, very, very important points raised. Um, the gentleman just across here, please. Go ahead. Thank you. Uh, Christian Curtis from the Office of the High Commissioner for Human Rights. Uh, so just a couple of points. One, a conceptual point, which is uh, human rights uh, should be present in, in the discussion. Uh, climate change uh, affects a number of human rights, freedom of uh, movement, uh, the right to health, the right to food, uh, the right to decent work, uh, the right to a, a healthy environment that was recognized last year in the, for, by the General Assembly, and even the right to life. Second, the impact on human rights is differential to so some groups, such as li people living in, in poverty, women, children, persons with disabilities, uh, uh, older persons ha have a different impact. So taking that into consideration is a way to consider the principle of non-discrimination and equality and the slogan of no, leaving no one behind. And third, action regarding uh, climate action for mitigation and adaptation needs to take into consideration a human rights-based approach, and that means participation, uh, that means taking into consideration civil society and the groups that are affected, that means uh, access to information and access to uh, decision-making and admits accountability, and finally it means international solidarity because these are issues that cannot be tackled by single countries. And second, on the action side, uh, OSCHR works on this in many fronts. And I, I would just give one example, which is in the Pacific, there is currently a, a regional protection framework developing uh, on climate-related mobility. Uh, and to action to develop the action framework, uh, there's, it, th this is going under the umbrella of the Pacific Island Forum with support from the UN, OSCHR, uh, Pacific Regional Office uh, in uh, Fiji is taking uh, part of a joint program, the Pacific Climate Change Human Security Program with IOM, ESCAP, ILO, the Pacific Islands Development Forum and the Platform for Disaster Displa uh, Displacement who are supporting the action and of course the main uh, goal of this is supporting a new Pacific Regional Policy Framework for ch Climate Change Induced Mobility. Uh, and it, it is a good example of how UN joint programs can lead to collaborative actions with and by member states and regional organizations with significant engagement and critical accompaniment by civil society. Uh, we have some more examples, but I think that, that one shows uh, a, a good example of integration of the perspectives I, I've been relating to before. Thank you. Thank you very much for, for that point. Um, and uh, again, highlighting the, the importance of, of human rights. No question uh, that that is uh, of, of great importance here. And I think the project that you are referring to, uh, I've had, the, again, the, the opportunity to follow it over the last couple of years. And, and there are some very challenging um, legal questions in that, uh, what, what Matilda touched upon. What, what, what does it mean uh, if there in the future uh, would not be part of a country or even a country? Uh, legally speaking, we, we haven't really gone through that. Uh, and, and it's a very challenging uh, discussion, but, but thank you very much. Um, yes, please, uh, gentlemen, next. Yes, thank you. Thank you so much, uh, Par. And in fact, without knowing, I think I will just continue uh, what my colleague from HHR was saying. I'm Matthew Cognac with the ILO, the International Labor Organization Office in New York. And just to start, maybe to make a quick allusion to what Ambassador um, Zacharias was saying at the beginning when I believe you were saying we, we have to find a way to deal with these long acronyms. Uh, here is another one, <laughs> because the project is PCCMHS, <laughs> which is the Pacific Climate Change, Migration, and Human Security. But that's that's how that's how we, we, we know it. And and I think, as you rightly pointed, this project really is about the protection and the empowerment of communities. And among these components, it does have one important component on labor mobility. And I think what makes this project unique and it's what brings us here today in this partnership forum is that it really it is completely in line with the UN reform and this uh, idea that we need to have more joint programs because here we are joining six agencies together. Uh, with CHR, my colleague, uh, IOM, of course, ISCAP, uh, the Pacific Island Forum uh, Secretariat, PDD, the Platform on Disaster Replacement, um, and the ILO. And it's covering six countries 
uh, Kiribati, Tuvalu, the Marshall Islands, Vanuatu, and Fiji. And so together, as you have mentioned, uh, I believe all these partners have managed to you know, take a step forward towards strengthening labor migration governance, understanding that labor mobility can indeed be a meaningful climate resilience strategy and can lead to skills development, to income diversification, and also to sustainable businesses. And that by doing that, focusing on or having a, a lens on labor mobility, we needed to put decent work first. You would not expect less from an ILO official to mention <laughs> the importance of, of rights at work, of employment uh, policies, and of social protection access, and of course, social dialogue. So what is coming, uh, my understanding, the project first phase came to an end uh, just in December. It, it was running from 2019 to 2022, but the second phase is, is in the work, so that's, that's very good news. In the meantime, there is also another joint program with uh, uh, IOM and the ILO that will also deal with these labor issues and all of this to contribute really to the goals of the 2050 strategy for the Blue Pacific uh, continent. So thank you so much. Thank you very much for, for sharing um, that perspective uh, and, and of course on labor mo mobility, which we touched upon before. Um, looking around in the room, uh, yes, please. Thank you, Cynthia Stewart from the International Federation on Aging. And, and I appreciate what Christian and Matthew have said before me in recognizing the human rights issue and also for vulnerable populations. But as the theme today focuses on, you know, certainly SDGs, but also impact of COVID recovery, the elephant in the room is, is ageism and the fact that older persons are not being invited to the table. And I think it's particularly important when you're talking about climate change and the small island developing countries that some of them may have great migration and what the impact is and will be on older persons, more vulnerable populations, whether it be with disabilities, et cetera, is really astounding. So I, I just would love for us to think about how, what are the partnerships that have been identified that we can build on to really address this now? Thank you so much for bringing up that important aspect. Um, just taking the opportunity to, to mention that uh, in, in some countries uh, in the Pacific, that is very much what, uh, what sort of the civil society groups uh, have been working on, where you have large youth groups, but also an uh, uh, aging group. And as you say, the aging group is usually not maybe so mobile and therefore the most vulnerable. Um, so it's a, it's a very important point, and I'm sure that uh, everybody agrees that uh, it's, it's an additional dimension that probably isn't as prominent in the discussions as it should be. So thank you for bringing that up. Um, yes, please. Tom Hedberg, uh, International Medical Crisis Response Alliance. We've been talking to a great extent about um, uh, forced mobility and population relocation, and mostly in territorial terms. But something that ought to be considered as we uh, consider collaboration with other groups is that climate change also poses some very serious ecological impact on uh, populations in the Pacific and in the Caribbean as well, where foodstuffs are changed, where there are diseases now rampant among uh, fish and among other sea life. And this is something that really, I think, should be taken into uh, consideration as we partner with other groups, the marine biology that does impact these populations as well. Thank you. Another very important uh, point. Um, clearly, uh, this discussion uh, needs uh, a lot more time. Um, I do uh, see, uh, we have uh, Blanche, please. Uh, hi, my name is Blanche Dax. I work with UNHCR, the Office of the High Commissioner for Refugees. Uh, a lot has been said already, so let me try and zoom in. Um, we live in a world where over 70% of refugees um, come from and over 80% of internally displaced people live in the most climate vulnerable countries. Of course, amongst these most climate vulnerable countries, we see uh, the small island states 
disproportionately affected. Um, displacement across borders uh, and displacement within countries uh, are among some of the key consequences that have been discussed here already. Another element is in certain contexts also an increased risk of statelessness for populations affected, another area that deserves our attention and where um, UNHCR is working with uh, some of the states affected to um, prevent this from happening. Uh, as UNHCR, we of course support uh, the calls for increased um, financial technical support to climate vulnerable countries, including the SITs uh, for adaptation, loss and damage, uh, looking amongst others at early warning, preparedness, anticipatory action, but also reducing vulnerability and increasing resilience, as has already been uh, discussed by many of the speakers. Um, as a last resort measure, also looking at uh, plant relocation. Uh, sea level rise um, poses uh, a distinct and severe adaptation challenge. And uh, I wanted to mention there one specific project where UNHCR, IOM, and Georgetown University, together with the World Bank and the UN University, have developed a toolbox on planning relocations to protect people from disasters and environmental change, uh, a toolbox that seeks to provide concrete suggestions for states and other actors who are planning or contemplating as a last resort, um, the relocation uh, of people with a view to protect them from disasters and environmental change. Um, the link between climate change displacement is clear, has been growing, and uh, those least responsible are being hit hardest. Uh, in that context, uh, as has already been uh, mentioned and emphasized by some of the speakers on the panel, but just to... Um, um, add our voice to that, uh, what is most cru uh, crucial is to have those at risk and those affected, whether people already internally displaced, people hosting displaced, or people potentially at risk of displacement on the front lines of the climate emergency, for them to be uh, participating, leading, fully involved in the decisions that impact their lives. Uh, with the international community and us as part of that, urgently scaling up finance, support for adaptation, and loss and damage. Thank you so much. Thank you very much, uh, Blanche, and also for sharing that uh, tool set, which I think is something that uh, definitely could be explored further. Um, looking at the, the time, uh, I think I could allow for one or two uh, interventions more. I had the gentleman behind, unfortunately, yeah. and then I know that the gentleman down here has been asking for the floor. So please go ahead first. Thank you. Sorry. <laughs> Thank you very much. My name is Nifika Mwenda, the Executive Director of Pan African Climate Justice Alliance. Uh, 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 and uh, the issue of the nexus between climate change uh, and uh, migration, conflict, displacement and insecurity cannot now be gainsaid. And this panel is really, really important. In Africa, though many countries are not SIDs, but uh, it is increasingly becoming very clear that the issue of uh, the nexus is quite close, but the problem is that uh, this issue has not become really mainstream. And so the question is, uh, uh, is um, how is the UN, and particularly IOM, trying to ensure that this uh, uh, issue is not just a peripheral issue, that it becomes a mainstream issue? Because when you see all conflict, particularly in the African continent, in sub-Saharan Africa, where there are, there are, there are, there are, there are climate uh, disasters, uh, that is where you have now the hot spot of conflict. So there is that, uh, that synergy. And uh, these assans are actually drivers of displacement. And uh, you find uh, where there are chronic floods, sea level rise, extreme weather, the, the, this is where you find them. And for instance, uh, I just want to give an example. 14.1 million people uh, in sub-Saharan Africa were internally displaced in 2021 including 11.5 million to the, due to conflict and violence in Somalia and those others. That's where we have droughts in, in the Horn of Africa and those others. And so 
The problem which we are encountering is that um, it is very difficult to really connect. You find the response, the, the, the humanitarian response, both at government and even in, t in a humanitarian uh, uh, organization, they just have that quick fist, food and really addressing those without addressing climate as really a real uh, um, a, a factor, which is really very important. So I think this conversation is very important. And as actors in Africa, it's the, the time now we have started discussing on this, and we are in those. Con we will be interested to see how we can continue. It is not enough to have just an, a discussion, a signed event. I think it needs to be mainstream. We are aware that the, uh, the 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 UN has really tried, but how do we trickle down this conversation? How do we make them bottom up? Because UN is very far from people. Th that's very important. Thank you very much. Yeah. Thank you very much for raising that uh, that important point. We have, of course, mainly talked about the the Pacific and Caribbean today, but uh, but that is something that is well well noted. I will allow for one more quick intervention. The gentleman down, I know. Apologies, you've been asking for the floor. I didn't see you before, but thank you. And then we will close. I was actually really looking to ask a question. Uh, I don't know if this is working, but um, the, my question is this. Are there two parts to this um, question on population movement? Um, looking at the uh, long-term climate change or heat change uh, around the Earth due to the orbital factors. So the Earth is about 20,000 years into its movement towards the hottest period will be another 30,000 from now. And then the orbit starts to move further out again and we cool down to another ice age in the about 70,000 years, 80,000 years from now. There's, uh, so there's some things that we probably can't change like that. Uh, there are many others that we can change. Um, I do some work in northern Ethiopia, and we're just doing tree planting because uh, the noted climate change there from cutting down forests is that um, rainfall diminishes, and so we're just planting more trees again and with our student volunteers in the summer. Uh, the idea is, um, of course, that you can create more rainfall. Uh, so low-lying nimbus clouds tend to reflect heat away from the Earth. It's the high-flying cirrus clouds that tend to trap it in the greenhouse effect. So we do have some control over some levels of um, heat production or heat control or heat management. But some of it is probably inevitable uh, unless we have the technological capability of shifting the Earth's orbit at will. <laughs> which may be a challenge uh, if we go wrong on our calculations. This is really, I'm just asking this question because um, should there be two parts of planning? There's an immediate necessity to move people or uh, temporarily or to manage the um, increased damage from storms. But there's also the factor of do we need to address some long-term planning for how globally through the United Nations we can manage the... Um, uh, the best results for humankind as a whole. Thank you very much. Uh, that is that is a big question, sir, and and a very important one. Um, but um, I think we 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 will take that one on board and make sure that we uh, try to address that at the next uh, the next uh, you know side event. Um, I just wanted to give uh, since there was a specific question to the um, IOM. Um, the IOM Director General, a very quick 30-second response, please. Uh, and then I will give the floor to Matilda, uh, since I know that we're running late. Um, I'll be very brief, saying that, um, uh, of course, uh, it's not just the seeds that uh, we are concerned with because of climate change. That was the focus of this debate. But you are absolutely right. In Africa, we see uh, major extreme weather events that have a huge impact in people's mobility. But let's be a little bit optimistic. If you see the conclusions of Sharm el-Sheikh, you will see that for the first time, for the first time, it is acknowledged in the conclusions of Sharm el-Sheikh that uh, climate change is having a toll on human mobility. For the first time, migration is mentioned. You don't see the word migration in any other UNFCCC document before. And why was it possible? It was possible because 
13 countries of Eastern Horn of Africa have approved the Kampala Declaration, where they have asked the issue to be put in the agenda. Was, why was it possible? Because the Pan-African Forum on Migration joined all Af Sub-Saharan African countries saying we need to address the impacts on human mobility because of climate change. And it was possible because it was a COP in Africa and the leadership of an African country, Egypt, that made the possible and the impossible to have it in the agenda. So I will just conclude by saying, before the start of the, of the COP, I was told, oh, Mr. Director General, maybe for COP, 20, for COP 30, you will get it, <laughs> okay? We got it in COP 27. Great, but now, now we need to make sure that we keep the issue in the agenda. That's the challenge of, for all of us. Thank you, DG, keeping it on the agenda uh, and also implementation, I guess, of, uh, of the agenda. Um, again, uh, from my side, uh, I just wanted to, before I hand the floor over to Matilda to, to make a very cl a quick closing remarks, thank everybody, uh, both online and in the room, uh, clearly, this is a discussion which we should uh, next time dedicate several hours to. Um, it is a very interesting one, a very important one. Uh, but again, on uh, my own behalf, just thanking all of you for, for um, joining us today, uh, especially those online uh, from Pacific where it's very, very late. Uh, and uh, Matilda, I hand it over for you to you for a very short closing remarks, please. Thank you, and, and I am mindful that it is um, crunch time and we need to wrap this up. So, Excellencies and colleagues, on behalf of my permanent representative, His Excellency Fatimunawa III, Dr. Paolele Luteru, uh, who is also the co-chair of the Partnership Steering Committee, I am honored to deliver these very brief remarks with appreciation uh, for the uh, opportunity to be able to present some of our views on this issue, which, as we can see, is uh, something that could probably take up a lot more of our time than what we had today. Um, I'd also like to acknowledge with appreciation the contributions made by those around the table, uh, the UN Under Secretary General, Director General of IOM, uh, USG of DESA, as well as Co-Chair Ambassador uh, of Portugal, uh, and our organizing partners, including OHRLLS, uh, UN DESA, and um, if I have missed you, I'm very, very sorry. <laughs> um, our efforts in recovering from the COVID-19 pandemic is still impacting on our decision-making processes in relation to work, migration, and career pathways, which are still not fully known. Uh, these decisions will, in our view, be influenced even more by climate change impacts, and we should all work towards getting ahead of the problems before they become insurmountable. I'll end with a hope that this dialogue will be taken into consideration when issues regarding climate change mobility is discussed, or even people mobility in general is decided by policymakers. And I'll end here with a wish and a hope that everyone will carry these uh, discussions onwards, because things should not end here. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you, everyone, and thank you so much, panelists. Excellent. Thank you so much for joining us. Bye-bye.